Thank you very much, dear friends, brothers and sisters, for inviting me. Um, <coughs> I'm a pastor of the Protestant Church in Hessen Nassau. That's the regional church in Germany around Frankfurt. And mm -hmm. I've been working as, in the, as a staff member at the head office of the, gen of the community of Protestant Church in Europe. In, which is located in Vienna since four years and now after the General Assembly which took place in September in Basel I <coughs> became the new General Secretary, the successor of Bishop Bunker, the Bishop of Austria, the Lutheran Bishop of Austria. Europe is going to break apart. There's no doubt about it. Regular dreamers are already indicating the lines the future borders will run along. No, I'm not talking about Brexit and its still unclear consequences for the people in Europe and Great Britain. The breakdown of Europe has solid geological causes. Of all places, it's along the border between Germany and France that the continent will split. Along the Rhine Rift, in the region I call home, where my parents still live, Geographical features like these are an important factor in the rise and demarcation of nationalities and states. Great Britain defines itself according to its borders, natural ones, that is, not based on sharing the same language or culture, but along natural geographical lines, in this case, the sea. It's a very different matter in other European countries, particularly in Central Europe. There, the boundaries between states have shifted irregular at regular intervals. Some nationalities, such as the Poles until the First World War and the Hungarians in this aftermath, have been split between different states. During the 20th century, it was a fact of life for many, many inhabitants in s of Central Europe to repeatedly change citizenship without, without moving one's house. The nation state was often presented as, a, as the ideal, but where several nationalities share the same space, loading the nation and loading historical national monuments with ideology leads to conflicts and, in the worst cases, even to ethnic cleansing and wars, at, as most recently suffered within Europe and Yugoslavia. Where states cannot rely on natural boundary, boundaries, drawing borders leads to conflicts at some point. The United Kingdom also has a major inland border. It is on the island of Ireland and was bloodily enforced, subsequently causing repeated conflicts that caused death for many years. The United Kingdom has a second land border due to its enclave on Gibraltar. The significance of both borders diminished in recent years through the European Union and its cross-border movement of people, goods and money. This achieved the aim of the EU bringing people together, closer together, and thus contributing towards lasting peace by opening borders. But Brexit <coughs> has the potential to now change this. You invited me to talk about Brexit from the perspective of the Protestant churches in Europe. I would like to start off by pointing out that we are the community of Protestant churches in Europe the communion, the church communion of all these Protestant churches. Brexit or not, we stand together as the Protestant <coughs> churches in Europe. We are filled with pride that it was precisely the member churches of the CPCE that instigated the campaign Think, Pray, Vote as part of the joint public issues team. The initiative provided a lot of information in the run up to the referendum. I'm well aware that I will not fe face proponents of a hard Brexit at this event, but rather people who are wondering how the United Kingdom and its churches can maintain ties with Europe in the wake of the referendum result. Nonetheless, I would first like to raise some points of irritation before citing my wishes for a closer future affiliation. 
A. Irritations. Firstly, delimitation. The reporting about Brexit and the continent repeatedly on the continent repeatedly emphasized how the British feel too many Eastern Europeans lived in the United Kingdom. This challenges the concept of free movement for all EU citizens. It is a problem that so many Eastern Europeans work in the United Kingdom. But the main problem is for the Eastern European countries themselves, who are lacking those workers to develop their own home countries. The brain drain. It is easily overlooked in this argument that the ability to move within the EU is reciprocal. So while around 2.5 million citizens of other EU nations live in the UK, 1.5 to 2 million British people live in other parts of the EU. What happens with these British citizens? There are no transitional regulations so far. If the Brexit regulations fail, we need 27 single contracts by March. For instance, the Austrian government, where I'm living at the moment, they gave no assurance to UK citizens to stay in Austria. Secondly, loss of sovereignty and refusal to participate. One of the Brexit movement's key slogans was take back control. <laughs> also, it was claimed that they wanted to decide things for themselves it's long since clear that in many cases the European Union sets the rules for politics and the market, whether the European countries concerned are members of the EU or not. Even for Switzerland, many decisions are made in Brussels and no longer in Bern. Brexit means the United Kingdom abandoning its rights to play a role in determining rules that will subsequently, subsequently apply to it. So in this sense, Brexit constitutes a loss of sovereignty for the United Kingdom. <laughs> Thirdly, diminution. However important we consider Europe and the, United, uh, and the European Union, at the same time, we have to bear in mind that Europe is not the world's epicenter. The world is undergoing a process of change. Whereas in 1900, 25% of the world's population lived in Europe, by 2015 it was just 6%. And Europe's shares, share of the world's population will keep on rescinding. In the space of 160 years, just 40 years from now, the proportion of the world's population living in Europe will be, have shrunk from 1 in 4 to just 4%. In the face of this, this development, to withdraw into your own country, one that makes up just 10% of the popula population of Europe, is an, in an attempt to make yourself stronger, exhibits blindness towards global development. Fourthly, economic regression. It might be said that in return the United Kingdom's departure from the EU finally liberates its economic performance and currency from the ailing economies of southern and eastern Europe. But between 2015 and 2017 alone the relevance of the Great British Pound as a reference value in the International Monetary Fund <coughs> fell from 12% to 8 While it has to be conceded that the relevance of both the US dollar and the euro also deteriorated from, from 48 to 43 percent and from 33 to 30 percent respectively. The fact that all three are losing out to the Chinese yuan, which has risen by 11 percent, confirms that global economic weightings are shifting. <coughs> Fifthly, retropopia. A recurring chorus amongst the arguments proclaiming by proponents of Brexit is reference to the good old days. 
This goes hand in hand with backward looking focus on the Commonwealth and the glorification of the country's magnificent colonial past. The sociologist, sociologist Sigmund Bowman, <coughs> who passed away last year, called this nostalgic yearning retrotopia. This consciously ignores the changes in global power relations. The populist parties in Central and Eastern Europe use similar imagery. As Ivan Krastyev, the Bulgarian sociolo sociologist, demonstrates in his essay After Europe, in which he points out that instead of promising people a positive future, they simply assure them that everything will remain as it once was. Sixthly, rejection of peace processes. Never again war on European soil. This proclamation is deeply ingrained in the memory of the EU founding states. The experiences of the horror and destruction wrought by the two world wars during the 20th century spawned the desire to do everything possible to avoid war every breaking out again at European soil. This is what led to the formation of the European coal and steel community to commonly control the raw materials required for waging war. The conflict was airborne in Great Britain, which meant they experienced the war differently. At the same time, the longest armed conflict in Europe of the second half of the 20th century took place in the United Kingdom. From a U European perspective, the EU played an instrumental role in ending the civil conflict in Northern Ireland by appointing greater weight to a Europe of regions, opening borders, including that between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and leading to democratic paradigms based on fair participation, such as redrafting the constitu constituencies in Northern Ireland in a way that no longer automatically accorded Unionists, the majority say. Those of us remaining in the EU find it incomprehensibly, incomprehensible how the discussion addressing the border between Ireland and the United Kingdom is being almost entirely, entirely reduced to economic arguments. If the conflict in Northern Ireland were to erupt again due to Brexit, that this was would signify the United Kingdom withdrawing from the European project for peace. B. Encouragement. <laughs> what can I offer you in the face of these disturbing observations? First of all, we share your suffering. We know that not no one really wanted what the United Kingdom is now facing. Neither the Brexiters, who based their negotiations on unrealistic assumptions, nor the Remainers in any form whatsoever. It is dreadful to watch people facing the prospect of having to live with a poor compromise. However, it is even more awful to have to live with this poor compromise yourself. We share your suffering and feel compassion for you. Secondly, if the political community in Europe is placed into doubt, then this makes the community of Protestant churches in Europe even more important. In recognizing one another in the community of Protestant churches in Europe, more than 100 Protestant churches offer each other pulpit and table fellowship, recognize one another's pastors and jointly commit to raising the voice of Protestantism throughout Europe. We are church together. This was expressed very tangibly at the General Assembly, the entirety of which we conducted in Basel Cathedral. The atmosphere was breathtaking, celebrating worship together and discussing the future of the church in Europe in the nave of the cathedral. I think that everyone pres present sensed that our church community is a communion of worship. And a church communion like the CPCE isn't simply an ecumenical umbrella organization, but also has an ecclesial quality of its own. 
This shows how we are church together. During the era when Europe was divided by the Iron Curtain, we succeeded in bringing Christians together across borders, in debating pressing issues together. Meeting with one another face to face is an inestimi inestimably important element of fellowship. We must intensify this kind of interaction in the future. The churches of the British Isles are therefore invited as of last, as of last year to work as a part of the Northwest Regional Group of the CPCE and participate in regular discussions there. Thirdly, get to know Europe better. <laughs> Some might be minded to say it's too late for that now. When I attended the General Assembly of the United States Reformed Church in Nottingham this year, it struck me how many delegates had never visited Europe, <laughs> let alone Eastern Europe. Do you know what? The British regularly turn up to joint meetings and one uh, an hour late because they're not aware of the time difference with the continent. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't really grown any closer to the continent during the past <coughs> decades. Referring to Europe and the U EU, most British men and British women I know don't use the word we. They always refer to Europe as they, an expression of a failed approximation in the past. You have the amazing good fortune to that English is understood almost everywhere in Europe. So you don't even have to learn another language to explore Europe. Fourthly, you should recognize Europe as the playing field that God has given us. Brexit or not, the cultural dimension of Europe, which stretches beyond the EU, transcends national confines and yet defines a distinctive area in the increasingly globalized world. Our actions have global repercussions and the horizons of our scope of actions are often no longer lo local or national, but rather European. This is true with regard to its, the issues of migration, climate protection and terrorism. And in many respects, this will not change because of Brexit. One of the problems was simply that, for the most part, people in the United Kingdom didn't want to face up this fact before Brexit. Fifthly, let us join forces to combat what is currently the most widespread disease in Europe, fear. As churches, it is our duty to proclaim salvation to the people, to heal them and help overcome fear and those who incite it. It is our duty to keep both feet on the ground and to tell people of the hope that inspires us. Tell them that everyone has the right to a positive future, that even the weakest member of society must have share of our wealth and the social security that everyone in a community must be able to rely upon and tell them that we can play our own part in making the world a better place. We, your brothers and sisters in Europe, want to remain at your side to help in any way that we can. The theological fault line in Europe allows us enough time. Another 15 million or so years, in fact. <laughs> Until then, we can continue to shape our lives together in Europe, and surely, keep on finding new forms of communion. There's a lot of us, th there are a lot for us to do. By trusting in God and relying on our allies, we can get to it. Thank you very much. And now the third speaker who comes from Italy, David from uh, the Valdensian Church, who we also have met at the URC.